Welcome everybody. Hi, I'm Claudia Silk. I'm from the Fairfield Public Library. I'm an adult services librarian and I'm thrilled um, to bring Wes Means back. He did a presentation for about a year and a half ago that was um, very well received and so interesting. I've never driven down the Merritt Parkway without thinking about all the things that Wes taught me in his presentation. So I hope you enjoy this evening. I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on Wes and then and Wes will take over. So Wes Haynes is the executive director of this Merritt Park Way Conservancy. A native of Stanford, Wes's long career in historic preservation has included senior staff positions with the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation, New York Landmarks Conservancy, Pres Pres Preservation League of New York State, and New Jersey Historic Trust. He has worked on the planning and implementing restorations of New York Central Park, the New York State Capitol in Albany, and Adirondack Creek Camps and directed a recently completed survey of 1,500 historic mills for the Connecticut Trust. Wes has taught historic preservation at the Parsons School of Design, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and the Brooklyn Institute for the Arts, and currently serves as a volunteer preservation advisor to the Mary and Eliza Freeman Houses in Bridgeport, Stanford's First Presbyterian Church, and the New Canaan Preservation Alliance. Please join me in welcoming Wes back to the Fairfield Public Live. Thank you, Wes. Thank you, Claudia. And good evening, everyone. Um, I'm really glad we had I have a good turnout tonight. Um, the let me tell you a little bit about the conservancy. Uh, we're kind of an unusual organization. There aren't too many conservancies attached to roads in the United States, but the Merritt Parkway is a pretty extraordinary road. Um, sitting here, you know right under our noses as a great benefit to the quality of life in Fairfield County. Um, it, uh, it's uh, unusual because it's listed on the National Register of Historic Places as a historic place. And it's also designated by the federal government as a national scenic byway, uh, which uh, mostly, both, the, both of those are mostly honorific, but because public money is used to uh, maintain and rehabilitate the parkway, the, uh, uh, it triggers a, a more rigorous design review to keep uh, the aspects of the parkway uh, parkway-like. Um, and so, uh, so the road doesn't become another I-95. And that's really pretty much what we're all about. Um, uh, we work closely with DOT to make sure that the work is done uh, to a certain standard and designed well. Um, we're also very, very, uh, cognizant of the development along the viewshed of the parkway. Uh, right now, uh, we're opposing a development, uh, Black Rock Turnpike, um, that's being proposed that, pro proposed that would overwhelm the, the parkway at that point. It's a huge uh, building that is just terribly sighted uh, from the point of view of the parkway. So um, those are a couple of things we do, but the fun part of my job is to uh, go out and talk to people about the history of the parkway and uh, give these virtual tours. You know, we can't bring buses on the parkway to show people, uh, but because of Zoom, we, we can all feel like we're on a bus driving down the parkway. Uh, we're not gonna go uh, bridge by bridge tonight. We're gonna bounce around a lot. And I'm gonna start off um, with a little bit of, of uh, context um, that uh, is uh, just to give you some background on what went into the thinking of the bridges on the parkway. Uh, let me see if I, okay, good. I got the right control there. Um, so uh, so this is the, uh, the title slide. And uh, I, I thought it was interesting that Claudia picked um, this image to illustrate uh, it for the, um, for the Fairfield Public Library. Uh, this was a lighting project that we did uh, back in 2002 when we were just starting out. Uh, the bridges had never been, in fact, there had never been any lights on the parkway. Uh, for the season of the holiday season in 2002, we lit two of the bridges um, to wide acclaim. It got picked up nationwide. Um, it was very, very popular. Um, now the, the technology has changed so that it's actually cheaper and less invasive to light the bridges uh, for their architectural effect. And uh, we're exploring that idea right now with DOT again. Uh, with LED and hope to uh, perhaps uh, 
fingers crossed, um, celebrate the end of the pandemic this year with a, a bridge lighting project on the parkway. So I thought, I, thank you, Claudia, for uh, picking out this slide for, for the talk. So the parkway is very unusual for a number of, of aspects, but one of the, the things that's really distinctive about it is the, the bridge designs on the parkway. Uh, there were 69 original bridges uh, on the parkway, and uh, no two of them are identical. Uh, they're all different. They're very similar in terms of structure. Uh, many of them are, are similar in terms of, of structure, the majority, but, um, but they, are all, they all carry a distinctive design. And that was unusual in its day outside of a park. You know, if you've walked around Central Park, you see that all the bridges in Central Park that were put in a generation before the parkway was built uh, are all singular design. They, they don't repeat themselves. They're all different, one-off bridges. Well, the parkway was kind of the, the Merritt Parkway was the last gasp of that kind of differentiation in the United States. And uh, these, these are just some of the drawings that were done by the, uh, the Historic American Engineering Record, which was a WPA program that put unemployed engineers to work to go out and record the bridges. It still continues to this day. And these, uh, these drawings were made in the 1990s. Uh, this this uh, sort of gives you an idea of, of what um, the parkway was up against when it was put in. It, it followed a brand new route that had never been used before by uh, pedestrians or by, uh, by horse and wagons or railroads. Uh, located approximately six miles north of the shoreline, um, it's very rugged terrain in that part of the county. Uh, we are at the end of, of a very glaciated landscape. And so we have a lot of river valleys and hills. And this was a very difficult uh, area to get across. Uh, no one had ever put a highway in. Um, most, of our highway, most of our road networks that, that we have today that go north-south, the older roads, were all developed out of Native American foot trails. There was never any foot trail that went this way because it was just too difficult to go up and over these hills. So it wasn't really until the advent of the automobile that this was even possible, but they were breaking new ground and they were dealing with an existing context and existing network of roads that mostly ran north south from the shore up into the, the northern uh, communities, either along the ridges or along the valleys. And, um, and the parkway had to cross all of those. One of the objectives of the parkway was to, uh, to eliminate all on grade crossings. It was one of the first roads in the United States to do that. Now it's sort of pro forma with the interstate highway system, but the parkway was one of the first, uh, along with the Pennsylvania Turnpike, they were both built at the same time, were the two first roads to, to sort of accomplish that. So that meant that there needed to be a lot of bridges and, um, and to make sure that the, the bridges didn't cost too much, um, they were. Uh, they tried to keep the bridges as low as possible, so they didn't have to elevate the roads that were crossing over the parkway uh, too high, and and that's why um, they all pretty much are the same scale. They were really kept that way. Um, that the parkway was designed for cars. It was not designed for trucks. In fact, it was specifically an alternate route to Route One uh, for just automobiles and. So they didn't need a lot of clearance at the time. So this gives you an idea. This is um, looking west um, uh, from uh, Congress Street Bridge um, across uh, the, the far bridge in the background um, is, uh, is the Morehouse uh, Highway a Bridge. So um, to give you a sense of it's an idealized view, um, but it wasn't really very developed around the parkway when the parkway went in. Uh, it was a little bit more developed than it's shown on this, this image, but uh, this was really a, a sense of what the parkway was all about. Uh, there are basically um, four types of structural systems, and, and I'll just start with a very quick overview of what they are. Uh, nearly all of the bridges, all but six of the bridges, are of this one type of structural system that was used for early automobile bridges um, in the uh, 1930s when the parkway was built. It's called a rigid frame. Um, it's actually, these are all steel, the, the structures of these bridges are all steel and they're clad with concrete. 
uh, the concrete isn't structural in, in these bridges. The, um, it's, it's outlined in the red. Um, they're uh, basically beams that are carried by posts at each end of the bridge. They taper in the middle, uh, which allows uh, allowed the architect uh, to actually shape them all as arches, which is a lot more graceful. Um, there are only a few bridges that don't have arches on them. Uh, in some cases, the steel is exposed. Uh, Clinton Avenue is a good example of that. But in most cases, the, the uh, steel is encased within concrete. And um, they, this was a, a very economical way to, uh, to uh, build the bridges at that time. So all but six of the bridges are of this, this type of, uh, of system. Uh, two other systems uh, are used on a couple of bridges each. Um, post and beam up at the top. Um, Riversville Road in, um, in Greenwich is uh, one of these um, uh, types of bridges. Uh, these are uh, don't really have the rigid frames with the taper. These just have much heavier beams. They were much longer uh, spans to cross. And um, they weren't that different from what was going on in, um, in Germany at the time with the Autobahn, uh, the, the, uh, which became the standard for the American interstate highway system. The other um, type of bridge that was being used was an arch, a true arch, um, where uh, the, the arch was formed very similar in the way that it was in ancient Rome with a lot of false work and then poured in place. And so it's actually an arch that's holding the bridge up. And there are only two of those, uh, Park Avenue in um, uh, uh, Trumbull and, uh, and the uh, Guinea Road Bridge in Stamford are the only true arch uh, bridges on the parkway. Uh, but really one of the most um, unusual bridges uh, that really no one ever sees, but you go across it, uh, this was the engineering feat of the parkway in terms of bridges. And that is the Saugatuck River overpass. It's right next to where the Westport Y is uh, now, the new Westport Y is, which is visible from the parkway. And this was a, a type of, of uh, structure called an open spandrel arch that was invented by Charles Eiffel, the, um, the great French engineer who did the Eiffel Tower. Um, and uh, he uh, used it uh, for a number of things. It was adapted for railroads and it was very, very economical to build where you had a deep valley. And that's pretty much the deepest cut in the, uh, on the route of the parkway was the Saugatuck River. And they wanted to keep the road as level as possible. So they used one of these, uh, Leslie Summer, Sumner was the engineer um, who designed all the bridges on the parkway. And uh, he was a Yale graduate. Um, and most of the bridges before 1950, before the interstates um, in Connecticut, the really big bridges, the bridge between uh, Portland and uh, Middletown uh, and the uh, Charter Oak Bridge were designed by uh, Leslie Sumner. He was a really uh, very, very accomplished engineer that we had. Uh, and this is pretty much uh, how Sumner adapted uh, uh, Eiffel's design using solid web steel uh, that was bent instead of the lattice steel that, uh, that uh, uh, Eiffel per, uh, preferred um, for his bridges. And this is uh, on the right is pretty much what you see of this bridge when you go over the parkway. Um, uh, we have just restored the original um, lattice, uh, the, the original ironwork um, railings, uh, they replaced Jersey barriers that have been put up there in the 1990s um, in, in to, to widen the road. Um, and this is what the bridge looks like pretty much from uh, an oblique angle on the left. So you can see it here, on, but you really can't see it when you're on the parkway at all. Now, the architecture um, fell to uh, an, uh, an architect by the name of George Dunkelberger. Uh, not necessarily a household name like Frank Lloyd Wright, um, but um, his, he really, this was his really one great work. Um, he did all the rest of the service areas um, on the parkway, he did the toll booths as well, but the bridges were really um, what he was hired to do. Um, he was an unemployed uh, or underemployed architect in the when the depression hit and uh, took a job with the Department of Highways as a draftsman. And when the parkway got appropriated, um, they basically they, he had it such a nice drawing hand that they turned over the design of the bridges to Dunkelberger. And 
Um, he didn't really write a lot. He didn't leave a big paper trail. In fact, this is the only photograph we have of him on his wedding day. Um, but, um, but he did, uh, at the end of the park, uh, when the parkway opened, um, basically he kind of summarized what he was trying to do here. He was trying to create bridges that were pleasing to the eye um, and a radical departure uh, from highway bridges. And I don't think anyone would argue with that. There's no other road in the United States that has bridges like the Merritt Parkway. Um, and uh, each bridge being individual in character. And I think he uh, certainly succeeded at that. Um, we don't know a whole lot about his background, but he was a graduate of the um, Drexel Institute, which is now Drexel University. But at the time it was the Drexel Institute of Art, Science and Industry. And um, it was modeled in the same pattern that Cooper um, Union in New York was, uh, Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. Uh, to pro provide people of modest means an opportunity to get a, uh, a good education uh, to go out and pursue a technical career. Drexel had a slightly different curriculum than the others because it required you to take um, equal classes in all three areas of art, science, and, in, and, uh, and, uh, and engineering. And so, uh, Dre so uh, Dunkelberger had a very rounded education. He grew up in Camden, New Jersey, right outside of, of Philadelphia. And Philadelphia was the one city of the United States where most of the major innovations in bridges up until that time took place. Um, when Dunkelberger, uh, before World War I, when he was in uh, college, he had um, at his disposal uh, to look at just about every type of bridge from the first um, wire strand bridge that predates the, uh, the Brooklyn Bridge by about 40 years um, to one of the uh, earliest innovative trust bridges uh, across the, the school kill. So he, um, it was probably, the Philadelphia was probably a large part of his, his education um, and maybe his interest in bridges in the long run. Uh, but he did come to uh, Connecticut uh, with a very uh, conservative Connecticut um, and put in play a lot of really interesting bridges. Now, within that time that he was designing these bridges, Two, uh, two international fairs sort of dominated the, uh, the design world. Uh, one was the World's Columbian Exhibition, Exposition in Chicago in 1893 to celebrate the, um, the anniversary of Columbus's discovery of the New World, uh, which was uh, carefully planned uh, with uh, classical architecture laid out by Frederick Law Olmsted, who was also the architect of Central Park. And, um, and it was designed around a canal, which featured a number of, of uh, really uh, beautiful bridges uh, that, uh, that were based on uh, Renaissance, Italian Renaissance prototypes. The second big, uh, and, and, and the, the, this fair introduced the whole city beautiful movement to the United States. The Merritt Parkway is considered one of the last gasps of the city beautiful movement, uh, which ended with urban renewal um, in the, and the interstate highway system in the 1950s when there wasn't a whole lot of attention paid to how things looked when they crashed through our cities. And, um, uh, but at this point, classicism was, was, uh, was king and uh, every, all architects were designing in some sort of classical mode. The second big influence was the Paris Exposition uh, of uh, Decorative Arts and Industries uh, in 1925. And that was the fair that introduced Art Deco to the world. So uh, Dunkelberger has these two influences. Um, he's only two years old when the fair, the Chicago fair occurs. Uh, so he pretty much didn't, if he went to it, he doesn't remember it. Uh, but he's very, very aware of, uh, but is, it is the dominant um, architectural current um, until Art Deco comes in while he's a youth and just out of school. And so he was very influenced by uh, that, as was the whole country. And to show you just an example of how uh, the, the Art Deco and the um, the neoclassical styles kind of melded together by the 1930s. Uh, the Arlington Bridge in Washington, D.C. is a really good example of that, right on the eve of Dunkelberger's designing the Merritt Parkway bridges. Uh, it's done by McKim Mead and White, a uh, very prominent architectural firm, and it runs between the Lincoln Memorial and Arlington Cemetery. 
And it's in a style that is called starved classic because it's not fully developed as a classical structure, although you look at it and it is very classical in feeling, but it's got, uh, it's really streamlined with a lot of, of more sensuous curves uh, that were more associated with the um, Art Deco. And that's pretty much the way that Art Deco was uh, mainstreamed in American architecture in that way. Classicism was still dominant at the time and Art Deco was kind of like an overlay. What I think that, um, that Dunkelberger did with the Merritt Parkway, which is really pretty extraordinary, is he tried to balance the scale there. He tried to uh, give each, uh, each design current uh, equal weight. And that's why the bridges look so different from any other bridges in the United States. So let's look at, at some of the bridges that Dunkelberger did that were more neoclassical than others. And, and some of the, um, the things he was referencing. Um, this is the um, uh, Augustan uh, Bridge um, across uh, um, in, uh, in Rimney, um, outside of Bologna. And uh, this is one of the few bridges that survived from antiquity. Um, and this was mined for details, uh, not physically mined, but, but architects went uh, during the Renaissance and began to record this bridge and document it. Uh, to develop new bridges during the Renaissance. Um, and they came up with a kind of a vocabulary for how to ornament a bridge um, that uh, they preferred to have the, uh, the, the face of the bridges look like stone, ashlar stone set in a regular pattern. Um, the, the, the upper parts of the bridge terminated with a lot of shadow play uh, formed by corbels, which are up there at the top. Um, the piers between the arches um, were ornamented with niches, um, which uh, became really kind of uh, what may have been singular to this one bridge became almost standard in Renaissance and uh, American Renaissance bridges. Um, and of course, these bridges were all based on the Roman arch, which is um, uh, Rome's uh, major contribution to culture besides uh, some of the political thinking uh, that went on there. So. Uh, this was this was a bridge that um, all the architects of, uh, of Dunkelberger's day would have been aware of, uh, including Dunkelberger. Uh, and you can see some very very uh, faint elements of this in a kind of Art Deco uh, style uh, in the Round Hill Road underpass, uh, one of uh, one of two bridges that actually use niches in the piers uh, on the on the bridges. Um, that uh, this one's in Greenwich. This is the first bridge you encounter when you come across the New York line. And, um, and it has the corbels um, and it has uh, a Renaissance uh, termination at the top, which is called the balustrades. Um, the ancient Rome did not uh, have open balustrades, uh, meaning open work that, that was carried by a lot of short piers. That's a Renaissance invention. Uh, so, uh, he's kind of mixing, uh, Dunkelberger's mixing the Renaissance with ancient Rome here, but, um, but it's, it's a pretty clear reference to the Rimini Bridge um, in a very abstract way. Um, and closer to home in Fairfield, uh, the Sport Hill Road, uh, Route 59 underpass, um, also uses ditch, uh, uh, niches. Uh, here, uh, detail with little Juliet balconies, um, as if someone could stand up there and and uh, pronounce things to the passing traffic. Um, and again, with uh, an open suggestion of a balustrade at the top of, of the bridge. So these are two of, of, uh, of the types of classical bridges that, um, that he was working with. The, the major uh, bridge that, um, that, uh, that was built during the Renaissance is in Florence. It's the Holy Trinity Bridge uh, designed by Michelangelo originally um, completed by in the next generation by another architect, uh, destroyed by the Nazis during World War II and reconstructed. And this is how it looked reconstructed, but it was done very accurately. And uh, this is the bridge that most of the, uh, the post-1893 fair, and in fact, all the bridges at the 1893 fair were modeled on, um, and also the one that, uh, that Dunkelberger primarily modeled the classical bridges on the parkway after. Um, and some of the details here that are different from the classical bridges is that uh, the piers have these kind of projections on them 
that um, that are detailed like the hull, the, the, the bow of a ship, and they're called cutwaters, uh, uh, cutwater pylons, uh, to, to divide the water as it's coming down the bridge and, and, and send it under the bridge rather than directly into it. Um, there's a little bit of ornament at the top of the arches, um, and those are called cartouches. Um, you'll see a lot of those on the Merrick Parkway. And um, the elliptical arch, um, which here is a structural arch um, that's different from the, Rome, the ancient Roman arch, but it's, it's wider and it allows for more commercial traffic under it. Um, you know, the difference between Rome and the Renaissance is that the rivers by this point and the canals uh, were all major uh, um, corridors for traffic, just like our roads are today. So, um, so this was a, a major breakthrough and, and much copied and much admired. Um, many of the uh, bridges in Paris are modeled on this bridge. And, um, and uh, Frenchtown Road um, in Trumbull um, is probably the closest um, resembling um, bridge to, uh, to um, the uh, Holy Trinity Bridge in Florence. Um, even with a cut water, even though this bridge is not dividing any water and it's, and it's not even uh, dividing traffic at this point. I mean, uh, this, this is sort of uh, just a, a device that uh, Dunkelberger puts on the, the, uh, the, the bridge. Um, it's one of two bridges on the parkway that have cut waters on them. Uh, and uh, this um, is the, um, I believe this is, blocked up here. I can't read my own heading up here. Um, uh, this is Ponus Ridge. And um, uh, this one has a cartouche on it, um, just like the, uh, the, uh, the Florence Bridge has it, uh, right in the center of the bridge. Another uh, Renaissance bridge that, um, that informed some of what, uh, what Dunkelberger was doing um, is uh, the Rialto Bridge in Venice a very famous bridge, uh, and again, one that was designed for commercial traffic underneath it. So instead of a tight Roman arch, uh, it had a very spreading, but this is a true Roman arch that just goes deeper underneath the water. It's not an elliptical uh, arch, but it does show an early example of a balustrade um, and, uh, and relief sculpture um, that was used to decorate it, which, uh, which Dunkelberger will put to great use in, in his bridges. So when you get to um, something like uh, one of uh, my favorite bridges on the parkway, the Stanwich Bridge, which, you know, when you look at it, it's a pretty uh, simple uh, kind of neoclassical bridge. It doesn't have a lot of ornament unless you look at uh, the, the relief sculpture on the top of the pylons at the ends of the bridge. And then it uh, uh, is really quite spectacular and quite unusual. Uh, instead of uh, celebrating classical architecture here, uh, he shapes uh, the, the sculpture in, this, in the shape of an automobile key uh, with a winged tire, which was at that point an early symbol of, uh, of motorized transportation. So he's putting relief sculpture up here, but it's completely modern in sensibility. Uh, and this is just a wonderful piece of sculpture. And it was modeled by a New Haven sculptor by the name of Edward Ferrari, who we'll, we'll hear about a little bit more in a while. Um, this overpass um, uh, is, or I should say underpass, is uh, the North Street uh, Bridge in Greenwich. And um, it's a very plain and, and simple one. Really the, the main, main features here that make this one a kind of a classical expression is the way that uh, the Dunkelberger scored out the wing walls on the sides, uh, all the voussoirs over the, the top, um, hiding the, uh, um, the, the structural, the steel structural system behind um, as ashlar masonry. And then he puts a Renaissance, a very, very simplified Renaissance balustrade up on the top. Now, my cursor just, my arrow just, oh, there, okay, that's good. Um, Trumbull, the Main Street uh, um, underpass, 
uh, really is just a suggestion. Um, he doesn't even break it up into ashlar blocks. He just puts in horizontal lines. So we're starting to get more into a kind of a mix up of Art Deco and uh, neoclassicism with the Main Street uh, underpass uh, here. And Marvin Ridge, uh, at the time was considered a colonial revival expression of classicism, um, mostly because of these little details uh, at the top of the pylon there that we'll look at closer. But it was, um, but uh, the colonial revival was part of this whole City Beautiful movement, and especially in Fairfield County, uh, where we had a colonial heritage, we were slightly rural, and, um, and so it was uh, kind of a way of, of celebrating that in a lower scale, mo less monumental way in Fairfield County. Um, but here he does this kind of Adam-esque um, uh, little uh, insert, this relief ornament of an urn uh, set in uh, with uh, an, a pigmented mortar in the back that's blue. It looks almost like a, a, a moment of Wedgwood uh, on the parkway. So let's look at uh, move away from the classical bridges to the Art Deco bridges. Um, and here, um, what, uh, what Dunkelberger was looking at was contemporary architecture. He was looking at a number of different things for Art Deco besides the 1925 fair. But uh, the most evident part of, of his bridges <clears throat> are uh, the way that he looked at some of the most famous buildings of his day in New York City. On the far left is Rockefeller Center. And on the far right is the McGraw Hill building. Both were designed by Raymond Hood, uh, who at the time lived in Stamford uh, and commuted into the city. Um, and, um, and they're both uh, uh, masterpieces of modeling skyscrapers for completely different purposes. Rockefeller Center um, was an office building. And, um, and uh, both of these buildings were built under the new zoning laws, which required skyscrapers to be set back. Uh, at, at certain intervals. Uh, so the McGraw Hill building uh, is what most skyscrapers did. They, they kind of set back deeply. They went up straight deeply. And that was to allow sun and light, um, uh, sunlight to come down uh, to the street level rather than having these big bulky buildings uh, block uh, sunlight to the street. Rockefeller Center Hood uh, does something very different. He staggers the setbacks and, into almost a sculptural form. And in fact, it was very similar to the sculpture in the center, uh, which was uh, done by an American sculptor um, in, uh, who was living in Paris at the time. And, uh, and he was kind of exploring the way to mass uh, skyscrapers. So uh, whether or not um, Dunkelberger knew about uh, the sculpture, which was exhibited at the, um, at, at, uh, in, in the United States in the 1920s, uh, he was certainly aware of, of uh, Hood's work um, at Rockefeller Center, which really expresses verticality, and the McGraw-Hill McGraw building, which was designed uh, to carry, um, it was like a big loft industrial building to carry the printing presses of the McGraw-Hill company. Uh, so it had these very deep, heavy slabs um, between the floors that uh, Hood expressed on the exterior of the building. So. What he was able to accomplish in delicacy at Rockefeller Center, he kind of went against himself at the McGraw-Hill building and expressed horizontality. And if you look at the very top of the McGraw-Hill building, um, the termination of the building um, is really an iconic uh, figure of New York City, of the New York City skyline. Uh, it's, it's just this decorative piece that is a series of horizontal bands. And you'll see both of these buildings represented in the bridges of the parkway, uh, the design uh, elements behind them. Uh, let's start with um, the verticality. Um, uh, Dunkelberger sort of had a, a hidden, unstated uh, pattern of when he was on higher ground, he would express the bridge vertically. And when he was on lower ground, he would try to emphasize the horizontal elements of the bridge. This is the Congress Street underpass, which is not on a particularly high uh, point of ground, but it is before you drop down uh, to, <clears throat> to the Black Rock uh, Turnpike. Um, and uh, if you look at the pylons here, 
uh, they're, they're really pieces of sculpture that are, are massed very much like skyscrapers of, of their day. Uh, and you can see how they even set back very, very subtly with, with a lot of delicate uh, shadow play. Uh, my favorite, and I think the most ambitious of all of them, is Riverbank Road in Stamford, uh, which is really quite an exceptional piece of, of bridge design. Um, if uh, he splits the pylons into two separate sculptures uh, with a with a with daylight coming through the uh, the two uh, pieces of sculpture, but it's almost like two Rockefeller centers uh, placed a diagonal uh, to each other um, and uh, presenting themselves uh, to the public. So he was very creative with um, his building massing in on those bridges. Another uh, bridge that, uh, that expresses a kind of verticality and then a very beautiful setback in the wing walls over on the sides, um, which you know, produced a lot of shadow play as this photograph taken uh, when, it was, when the bridge was first built uh, is the Newfield Avenue uh, Bridge in Stanford. And, uh, and another one is, uh, and this is what it looks like today, We you can see some more of the detail of it that's washed out in that slide. Um, the, the striation in the, in the pylons on the sides, and then some horizontal elements too. Newfield is at the top of a rise, the parkway drops off beyond this. Um, as he's uh, climbing uh, the hill, uh, the, with the new Canaan Line Railroad um, that needed to pass over the, uh, the parkway uh, and required an extra pier in the middle of it uh, to support the weight of the railroad engines. Um, he kind of suggests just uh, with a little ghost of, of this kind of disappearing vertical element uh, within the pylon. So there is a kind of a rhyme and reason to this stuff. Uh, and then uh, an example of more of the McGraw-Hill building type of, of treatment is the Easter Road overpass. This is, this, this is a, uh, a bridge that is underneath the parkway and uh, cars pass through this to get uh, through the parkway. Um, and it's really a wonderful, there's, I've never seen another bridge like this anywhere. Uh, if, you, if you've ever seen a toaster from the 1930s, um, this, this one reminds me of a toaster and it reminds me of the top of the McGraw-Hill building. A really wonderful piece of sculpture. Now, the other, um, the other aspect of the Art Deco and the one that I think we mostly associate uh, with uh, the Art Deco uh, is the curved line, uh, not necessarily the straight line, but the curved line. And that all had to do with, in 1925 at the, um, the Paris exhibition, uh, was themed around fountains uh, and the spray of water and the gentle curve of water. On the left is the fountain that was sort of the centerpiece of the fair. Um, it was at the, uh, the, the hub of the fair. Um, it was lit at night um, in, in uh, uh, interesting colors and just through these sprays of water with all these curves around it. The one on the right was by the, uh, the French artist Lalique. Um, it was called the uh, Fountain of Perfume. It was for an interior exhibit uh, that, um, that basically uh, was a way of presenting a perfume. And I think they actually pumped scent fragrant water through uh, parts of this fountain to, uh, to scent the interior of this pavilion uh, at the time. So these were two of the most famous uh, sculptures that got adapted by industrial artists and architects uh, after the fair. And you can see um, some of these, uh, these features uh, popping up where uh, uh, Dunkelberger uses a kind of a fountain motif on three of the bridges. Uh, the first is the South Avenue underpass in New Canaan, um, where uh, he, you know, shows these kind of cascading tiers of fountains that, that uh, relates probably uh, to the main fountain at the 1925 fair. Uh, these are on the, uh, the pylons and these are just decorative ornamental uh, features. Uh, the White Oak Shade Road, which is another really terrific bridge, uh, very close to the other one, 
uh, is more in the leak mode. It's got heavier lines, uh, heavier flow of water, um, and uh, was probably the inspiration for that as well. Uh, even up to the top, where the the termination at the top of the uh, of the pylon here and at the top of the leak fountain are very similar. Uh, and then um, at the uh, North Avenue underpass in Westport, uh, which kind of combines the verticality of, um, of the skyscraper influenced uh, bridges uh, with, um, with some really delicate fountain work um, in the detailing. Did I not, oh, I, I meant to put in a detail of that. Um, I'm sorry about that. But the, uh, these dark black um, sections here, when you drive by it, uh, they're pretty pronounced. Um, they, they are detailed as, as waves of like splashing water uh, coming down from a fountain. So the, the very dark stripes over here are, are, uh, are his homage there to the fountain. Uh, he also uses the uh, curve that, that was introduced into design at that time and two bridges uh, in a very unusual way. One is wire mill and both, both of these bridges are related to the water. Uh, wire mill uh, uh, road uh, was uh, followed basically the Mill River in Stamford. And, um, and so it was a water course. And this is the only bridge um, that, uh, that he actually uses a curved wing wall on. Uh, he, didn't, he wasn't doing it to avoid anything. This was just for uh, decorative flair. Um, unfortunately, in the photograph above, which was taken in the 1990s, uh, it's completely overgrown. It's a little bit cut back now, um, but, uh, but it does have this kind of wonderful curve to it. Uh, and this is what it looked like when it was under construction, so you can get a sense of the scale next to a person up there on the scaffolding. And then the other one, if uh, this is not on the parkway, this is one of the... Um, the overpass bridges, and uh, the, the last one right before the Housatonic River in Stratford. And if you ever have you if you've never seen this this uh, bridge, um, I really recommend just getting off it um, for a minute um, at the last exit on the Parkway uh, Main Main Avenue uh, Main Street in in Stratford, uh, and driving underneath it. It's it's really a tour de force. Um, not only because of the very, very crazy looking uh, ironwork that uh, with these giant sized sort of sunflowers, but the, uh, the lines that almost uh, form a, either a rainbow or something else, but they carry the lines of the structure of the bridge. Um, it is almost like a, the end of a Warner Brothers cartoon to me, uh, where Bugs Bunny pops out and says, that's all folks. Uh, it's a really terrific bridge. Very unusual. Another design element at the fair uh, was uh, associated with uh, recent archaeology that had un uh, unearthed a number of Aztec ruins. And so there was a sort of a sense of um, an Aztec uh, design that uh, permeated a couple of the exhibits, including this one uh, gallery Lafayette uh, at the fair. Um, and uh, Dunkelberger picks up on this. Um, this is also on the South Avenue overpass that we looked at with, that was one of the bridges with the fountains on it. Uh, this is tucked next to the, um, up in the corner uh, next to the fountain. So he kind of mixes the metaphors there from the 1925 fair. Uh, but the, the uh, Aztec design was uh, very, also very favored by Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, he, he adapted it early. Um, in his designs. Um, and as you can see, it was really a, a big deal at the entrance, uh, the sunburst at the entrance to this pavilion. Uh, uh, Dunkelberger uses this sunburst on two, uh, also uses it on the um, Long Ridge Road uh, bridge as well in Stanford. And uh, here's a sort of a semi uh, Aztec, maybe semi fountain motif on the East Rocks Road in Norwalk. Uh, this is up at the top of the hill, so we have a lot of uh, vertical elements in this bridge, um, but, uh, but the decorative uh, detail on the pylon is, uh, is very unusual here. Uh, Morehouse uh, Drive, also called Morehouse Highway, 
um, is uh, a really unusual bridge that really has some influence from Frank Lloyd Wright directly uh, in his Aztec design, especially the Ennis House in uh, Los Angeles from 1923 that was widely published in its day. Um, Wright basically stamped uh, a pattern, uh, he called it textile uh, patterning on the building with an alum a cast aluminum uh, mold uh, to create a pattern, a repeating pattern on the building of, of small squares to decorate it. Uh, and Dunkelberger uses the same technique on this bridge uh, to very similar effect. Uh, not, not everything is stamped on it. It's really just the, the highlight trim, as you can see in the drawing below, uh, is picked out. Uh, but the rest of the bridge is scored uh, to look uh, in the same scale as the, um, as the stamp work. And up close, this is what uh, that detail looks like. Uh, it's, it's maybe somewhat Aztec derived, um, uh, it's, uh, but in the repetition of it, um, it, is, it is very, very atavistic, very primitive looking um, and, uh, and really quite, quite wonderful. And when you think that this, is, this bridge went into service in 1938, um, it looks very, very much more like something that uh, is out of the 1960s. Uh, so Dunkelberger was a little bit ahead of his time here, I think. Now, in terms of um, the uh, contemporary sculpture, uh, architecture at this period uh, was using a lot of bas relief um, in a very Art Deco kind of styling. Uh, if you uh, ever get a chance to walk around uh, the base of Rockefeller Center, uh, you'll see some wonderful bas-relief panels uh, that uh, are very, very similar to what Ferrari modeled uh, for uh, Dunkelberger on the Merritt Parkway bridges, especially at the Burr Street underpass, uh, which uh, celebrates both uh, the workers that built the parkway. Um, and there's another panel um, opposite this that celebrates the engineers that laid it out as well. Uh, very, very flat and stylized bas-relief um, sculpturing that's very, very much of its period of the 1930s. Uh, probably the most significant works of art on the parkway uh, are the Comstock Hill Road underpass. Um, Ferrari did the, um, the modeling of the bas-relief on the left of the um, Puritan, and his father, who was a very noted Italian sculptor, uh, did the modeling of the Native American on the right um, uh, for, for the parkway. These, these are just extraordinary works of art, especially the Native American. It is just such a fine piece of work. Um, and unfortunately, it's in concrete. And this bridge um, is undergoing some serious structural distress right now. So we have a big task ahead of us to try to figure out um, how to conserve this work uh, while getting the bridge back into good repair. Um, so that's, uh, uh, but, but th this, these are magnificent. And uh, next time you drive the parkway, I really recommend you slow down as you're going through Comstock Hill, at least down to the speed limit if you can, um, and maybe a little bit slower. So really take in uh, these works of sculpture because they're spectacular. Uh, Ferrari also uh, designed some work um, that was at, executed in Scrofido. So these are very, very flat. These aren't bas reliefs. These are very flat details. Um, and here is that uh, detail of the fountain uh, from the uh, North Avenue Bridge in Westport on the left, uh, showing the kind of bubbling fountain uh, motif. Uh, but um, with a pigmented mortar in the back and then uh, very carefully pressed in. Uh, forms uh, on, uh, that, that just are raised almost about half an inch above the, the, the background. So they're very shallow relief, but they really jump out because of the contrasting colors. And um, this was, Scrofito was used on about four of the bridges. These are probably the two finest examples. Um, the, um, Nor the Grumman Avenue bridge with the Griffins um, on the right and uh, the, the North Avenue bridge on the left. Now, a couple of bridges defy any sort of easy classification, and Merwin's Lane 
is is not something that is particularly classical. It's not something that's particularly Art Deco. It's um, it is completely out of the imagination of George Dunkelberger. Um, he treats the um, the the surface of the concrete here like it, it, like it's clabbers. So um, they're all like beveled beveled horizontal uh, surfaces that come down. A very you know very difficult kind of thing to execute well uh, with forms. And then Ferrari uh, details a, a lot of wildlife uh, on it, uh, butterflies, and, uh, in, and also modeled the cast iron uh, railing uh, with, uh, with other insects and uh, centered on a spider web. Um, this is a delightful bridge that, um, again, um, when you, when, whenever I get near Merwin's, I just slow down because I just love looking at this bridge. It's so beautiful. Um, and there is nothing else like this. You, it doesn't fit any known style, stylistic term used term by architectural or art historians. It is really a complete work of the imagination. And I would love to know more about the backstory. I hope someday we can find more of George Dunkelberger's papers. So this is just a, um, a kind of a summary of some of the variety of, of things that you will see if you really look closely. Uh, the only one that I haven't shown previously in this tour is the owl up in the right-hand corner, uh, which Ferrari modeled for a bridge that passes underneath the parkway, Hillside Avenue in Fairfield. Um, and it is one of the most beautiful sculptures on the, on the, uh, within the Merritt Parkway uh, historic as a historic place. Uh, and of course, I mean, a great place to end this tour is uh, at the James Farm uh, Road underpass, uh, which is uh, probably the one that uh, it's most represented in photographs. And when people do drawings and paintings of the parkway, they usually do this. Um, these are Nike's wings. Uh, Nike is the uh, symbol of civil engineers, and this was a kind of a victory lap for uh, civil engineers, and uh, modeled beautifully by Ferrari, and a, and a piece of uh, a very, very high quality uh, sculpture. Uh, it's modeled after the, um, the statue that is in the Louvre. Um, it's interesting to note that uh, at Drexel, there's a plaster copy of this that was in the hallway in the main entry hall uh, that Dunkelberger passed every day. So I think I have a sense of where he got the idea for it from. And Ferrari uh, basically took the wings, uh, Nike, uh, Nike's wings, tipped them vertically and, and made a wonderful uh, uh, sculpture of, of his own style. A very, very graceful uh, work of art. And I just want to touch a little on a little bit of what we do in terms of restoration uh, on the parkway, uh, on the bridges. Uh, some of it is just basic cleaning. Um, we work with DOT uh, to make sure that where we have an opportunity and there's not a lot of patching going on, uh, we can clean the bridge. Um, this is the Reading Road underpass that was cleaned last year, uh, made a huge difference in the way the bridge appeared. Uh, before up, up on the upper left and after on the bottom right. And Lake Avenue underpass in Greenwich, uh, this bridge was structurally unsound. Uh, all the steel work um, was replaced in it. Uh, this required us taking the uh, cast iron and the wrought iron work on the railings and that uh, wonderful uh, grapevine grid in the front uh, down care carefully. We weren't sure we were going to get it. Cast iron is very brittle, um, and we were uh, uh, very afraid that we were going to break a lot of it in doing it, uh, but we got it down. Um, the before is up at the left. It was just a kind of a rusting, hulking eyesore. Uh, we sampled the paint um, to find out the original paint colors on the bridge, and this is what it turned out to be, uh, a sort of a dark green uh, with gold highlights. Um, the, the, uh, the original ironwork was taken to a shop, uh, sandblasted down to bare metal, 
Uh, we mocked up the results of the paint analysis in the third panel from in. I was sandblasted with a very, uh, really sponge blasted with a very, very soft aggregate to remove all the paint. And then uh, repainted in a shop, shop with multiple uh, paints, uh, coats of paint. Uh, so we're hoping we won't have to revisit this bridge for a while to come. And, uh, and the great thing about it is that, that because the steel was being replaced, the whole bridge had to be taken out of service <clears throat> over the summer, but it extended into the school year. It was on a major bus route, uh, and we were able to uh, finish this all, get all this complicated work done um, uh, ahead of time, ahead of schedule, uh, and on budget. And it was a really uh, happy day when we opened the road again uh, in, uh, in Greenwich. And the one for you to watch out for now is, is undergoing restoration right now. It's the Clinton Avenue Bridge. Uh, here, the Conservancy hired a conservator uh, to come in and do analysis of the original mortar um, and uh, to determine, if you look up in the upper left-hand uh, uh, image that was taken soon after the bridge was uh, opened, there are these little uh, grill work panels that were inset uh, within the uh, concrete originally. Uh, they got lost over the years. They happen to be this kind of ruby red, uh, made in this ruby red matrix with crushed glass in it that gives a little bit of reflectance when um, when whites hit it. And uh, they are uh, they are back in place now. Uh, those panels uh, are back in place, and um, uh, the steelwork has been refurbished. The railing is at the shop um, undergoing treatment, and uh, when this uh, this should be done in the next two months and completed, and we're going to be really happy when uh, when this one shines again as well. So that's uh, pretty much the end of the tour, I think. Um, I will just uh, put up here, if you would like uh, to know the Merritt a little bit better, uh, the Conservancy has a guide to the Merritt Parkway uh, that um, is uh, uh, a map and then uh, some text on the other side uh, that points out uh, a lot of the histories of, of the major bridges and some other uh, highlights along the road. And I would be more than happy to send you one um, if you contact me at uh, this address and I'll leave this up while we maybe take a few questions um, and, uh, uh, and I'll be happy to mail you a free guide to the Merritt Parkway. So thank you for your attention and uh, We'll go into some questions now, Claudia. Great. Thank you, Wes. That was phenomenal. Um, I'm going to go, please, if you're not comfortable with the chat we, and you'd like to ask a question, just unmute yourself. But I am going to go through some of the questions that came through during the presentation. So um, Keith Bradley would like to know, how is the merit connected to the Hutch and Wilbur Cross? Well, <clears throat> that's an interesting story. Um, the Westchester system predates the Merritt Parkway, uh, but the original plan for the, uh, for the Westchester system was to pretty much go to, uh, to Harrison and then bend north and follow the route of what's today um, 684, I think it is, um, and, uh, and pretty much avoid Fairfield County altogether. It wasn't really planned to connect with Fairfield County. When the Merritt uh, announced in the late 20s that they were putting a highway in approximately six miles north of, of the Post Road, uh, Robert Moses had become uh, in charge of the Westchester Parkway system and uh, decided to abandon the northerly route up towards Danbury and instead uh, uh, connect into Fairfield County. So they didn't really know where the Merritt was going to hit the border until the land was acquired uh, about 1934. And then the, the Hutchinson aimed for the point uh, that the Merritt uh, hit the New York border. So it wasn't really a coordinated thing at first. There was a regional plan association. Uh, they were kind of loosely working through them, but they were really two separate uh, highway system developments. Well, and then what about the Wilbur Cross? <clears throat> the Wilbur Cross postdates um, the parkway and was the extension. Um, and uh, they knew immediately 
uh, the, the, the goal for the Merrick Parkway uh, was to improve uh, transportation between New York City and New Haven. So however you got through Westchester County, they didn't care. But once you were on the Merritt, uh, you would get to the Housatonic River. And then the um, connector was built soon after that dropped you back down onto Route 1, and you had to take Route 1 into New Haven. But given the almost overnight success, once the parkway the first stretch of the parkway opened in 38 and the second stretch opened in 1940, um, the, uh, they decided to, uh, to plan the route uh, uh, for the Wilbur Cross Parkway. The Wilbur Cross uh, was funded in large part uh, by the tolls on the Merritt. Uh, that's pretty much how what paid for it to be built. Um, and it was designed, uh, Dunkelberger designed all the bridges on the Wilbur Cross as well and the service areas. And when it came time in the 1990s to consider putting both roads on the National Register, uh, DOT decided just to put the Merritt on because it was the more groundbreaking of the two roads. Uh, the, the Wilbur Cross uh, is really a wonderful road and many people in New Haven County would like it to be on the National Register. And I think you can, just by driving on the two of them, they were, in the, they were in a similar condition when they first opened. And by driving across the, the Sikorsky Bridge and entering the Wilbur Cross, I think you can really see the difference it makes when uh, the planning of repairs on a road are done within a preservation ethic and on the Wilbur Cross when they're not. And, um, and I would really love to see someday the Wilbur Cross get a better treatment than it's getting now. But, um, but our focus with the merit is just on the merit. We have 37 and a half miles on our hands and that's about as much as we can handle really. Um, a question from Missy. Were the overpasses built at the same time as the parkway as the road worked its way up? They, no, they were, um, they were kind of built um, as they were designed and where they had acquired the, the rights to move buildings out of the way. So, uh, for example, um, uh, Sport Hill Road, uh, Easton Turnpike, was built two years before the road got anywhere near it. It was just a bridge standing out in the middle of a field for two years. Uh, it, there are some photographs of it. It's very surreal looking. And um, that they, because they had to move some buildings out of the way, uh, a, a barn and a house out of the way to, uh, to acquire the right of way there. Uh, they didn't move very far, but they, they needed to get them out of the way. Um, Missy also wanted to know, are there pictures somewhere? Let, let me see where her thing is. Where are the old pictures and other artifacts stored? That, um, a lot of the, there's a very good collection of old photographs of the parkway. In fact, many of the ones I use tonight um, on the, uh, the Library of Congress website. The, that's where the Historic American Engineering Record Report which was a very thick document. It's, it's about uh, this, this thick, if you can get in about a, a five, a seven eighths of an inch thick um, of, of recording uh, that included photographs and drawings and a lot of written documentation. That's all on the Library of Congress website uh, with the photographs. Uh, there's another cache of photographs, mostly snapshots that were taken by the guys that were working on the parkway uh, that are at the um, in the state archives um, uh, at UConn. Um, I don't know if you know the answer to this question, but um, why is there no exit forty five? Um, exit uh, exit forty five, I believe, um, was uh, was originally planned, uh, but not built uh, because of local opposition to having the exit put through the neighborhood. So, you know, when you think of this, uh, this, this road, this, this was, it was a very traumatic thing to put a new road through a place where people had already established patterns of life and uh, a sensibility of, of place. And um, the, it looks the way it does because that was the only way that they could convince people that they were putting in a really great looking road. And um, 
uh, and it worked. It, it, it did quash a lot of, of local opposition. People in Greenwich <clears throat> didn't want to see the Greenwich section completed and then the state just run out of interest or, or money and have all this traffic deposited in Greenwich on the back roads. So it, it, was, it was done very carefully. Um, but it, when it came to Fairfield, uh, Fairfield put up some serious opposition. Uh, uh, the folks in Greenfield Hill did not want uh, a road going through their neighborhood, especially because um, Sherwood Island was coming on as one of our first state parks at the time. And it would have been a major uh, point to go through down to Sherwood Island. So, uh, so th there were, you know, there were some good reasons. It was they were planned, but they weren't built, and they'll never be built. Interesting. Is, how is the merit funded? It seems like there was a lot of extra cost to create these individually designed bridges. Uh, um, you know, the, at the end of the day, the engineer Sumner Leslie Sumner uh, wrote that the cost of doing the extra um, decoration to the bridges only added to the cost of the bridges by 1% of their cost, their construction cost. So um, that's a pretty startling figure when, when you think what it would cost today and what it costs now to restore them too. Um, but uh, the, the project was mostly funded by bonds that were uh, paid for by Fairfield County residents partially paid back by the tolls when they came in. There was no, uh, there was only 2% of the total cost that was uh, paid for by the WPA. There was a great hope that the WPA would contribute more to the aesthetic qualities, but uh, somehow Fairfield County could never get the paperwork together to actually get the federal government to commit to, uh, to this project. So the state paid for, the, the county paid for approximately 70% the state paid for about 28% and the feds paid for 2%. Uh, very different from the way projects are funded today where the feds pay 80% and the state pays 20%. Do you have it in you for a few more questions? Because there's a few more questions. Yeah, I have, I, I'm happy to do more. Yeah. Okay. Um, why is it called the Merritt Parkway? Was Merritt a person? Yes, yes. Um, Skylar Merritt uh, was our congressman um, at the time when uh, the parkway was planned. Uh, Merritt was a very interesting guy. Uh, he was from Stanford. Uh, he was a local philanthropist. Uh, he helped build the local public library, the Ferguson Library in Stanford. He was in charge of uh, the fundraising campaign to raise the money to build it. Um, he was an industrialist. Um, he was the corporation counsel for the Allentown uh, Company in Stanford, <clears throat> one of uh, Stanford's biggest industries. Um, he also uh, summered in the Adirondacks. Um, so he had a great appreciation of nature as well uh, to, 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 where, you know, to go up to the wilderness. It wasn't necessarily a very, it wasn't as popular to do that uh, during uh, Merritt's lifetime. Uh, he was the only political figure that had the, um, the political gravitas to get all the parties um, in the county together to get on board with the Merritt Park with the Parkway, he also understood the need to separate car traffic from truck traffic. Uh, he he was a, a beneficiary of that because the faster that uh, he could move stuff out of his factory through Fairfield County on the Post Road by getting the cars out of the way was to his benefit as well. Um, uh, he was he was a, a forward looking uh, individual. Um, and a wonderful, uh, a, a truly wonderful man. Um, and, uh, and he put his money where its mouth was um, in many, many good projects in, in Stanford uh, with the hospital and another, a number of other things. And another question, has there been much damage to the bridges from trucks inadvertently ending up on the parkway and trying to fit under them? And if so, how is that repaired? Yes, it has done a lot of damage to the uh, to the bridges. Um, in fact, um, this Monday, uh, Senator Blumenthal and I were up in uh, New Haven at a press conference announcing a new initiative by Senator Blumenthal to try to get the um, the providers of free GPS apps 
to uh, put warnings on their apps uh, to warn trucks off the parkway. There are signs at every entrance on the parkway, um, but the trucks are hitting the bridges at a rate of one every three weeks right now. And that's just an intolerable situation. Uh, most of them do cosmetic damage, but every time a bridge hits a truck, it requires DOT engineers to go out and check it for structural stability to make sure that they haven't uh, bent the, the steel. You know, some, tr some trucks, if it's a, a, a closed panel truck, the steel on the truck is usually uh, less heavy than the, um, th than the bridge. But there are, there are trucks that get on there with heavy equipment, backhoes and things like that, that run in and smack into the, the bridges as well. So um, uh, it is uh, basically paid for by the taxpayers. Um, the fines for getting on the, uh, the parkway with a commercial vehicle are ridiculously low. Uh, they probably wouldn't even be a deterrent as long as the GPS systems keep sending uh, trucks onto the parkway. There are GPS systems that most responsible commercial truckers use uh, that they subscribe to, and they're programmed to direct trucks away from the parkway. Uh, it's really the free apps that, uh, that are the problem that Google and uh, Apple uh, provide on, on everybody's smartphone. And nobody looks at the signs because everybody's looking at their phone as they're following the app. So it's, uh, it's a real problem, and uh, we are trying to remedy it. Um, another question, and I could probably do another too. I'm curious, since you mentioned the obstacles posed by hills and rivers, why it was chosen to build so far inland as opposed to where a 95 ended up, for example. Was that because Route 1 was still a viable thoroughroad at the time, or are they just looking to bypass existing density? Um, it, it, that was a tug of war. That There were three routes that were proposed. Um, one was... Uh, one was pretty much on the route of I-95. It, it, that was really when I-95 was first mapped out. Uh, it was to go parallel and with uh, Route 1 and the railroad and weave in and out. Um, there was another one that was located uh, a little bit farther inland from that. And then this one was sort of at the edge of, of urban development at the time. And they chose the one at the end of urban development because they got less uh, feedback or uh, you know, feedback or pushback uh, from the property owners. Property values were cheaper up there uh, than they were in the more dense areas. And it was really, I mean, people did not want to see a new major road come through their neighborhoods um, where it was developed. At that time, we, Fairfield County was much, it didn't have as much sprawl development as we have now. Uh, that it was much denser around uh, Route 1 and the railroad. Uh, and then it, it filtered out the farther out you got. So it was the path of least resistance of the, of the three. But, you know, when I-95 when I came in, uh, all those concerns went out the windows. It was just a federal taking. Um, uh, the feds came in and took property by eminent domain and uh, there was no property that was acquired by eminent domain on the parkway. Everything was a voluntary sale. And that, I think, speaks really highly for it as well. Um, I'm going to end with this question. Irene would like to know, how should we get to see the, is there any slow traffic time when a person can see these bridges without causing a pileup? Rush hour. That's what somebody, Keith Bradley, asked. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, just uh, in fact, that's when I usually do. Uh, I try to drive the parkway once a week, and I usually try to drive it during rush hour so I can go slowly and take a look at what's going on on the shoulder and what's going on with the bridges. So, okay. if if you're if you're patient and you don't mind, you know, you have to keep an eye on the the car in front of you in rush hour, but you can really uh, enjoy the bridges uh, at rush hour. Wes, thank you so much um, to everybody who stayed with us. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us tonight. Wes has two other talks that he and I are going to talk about tomorrow that we're going to do in the upcoming months. Um, you might want to just give a little plug of what they're about, Wes. Sure. Um, we've also developed two other uh, virtual tours that look at two, two uh, really important building types that were in Fairfield County that the parkway uh, 
really preserved or conserved by, uh, by avoiding going right through them. Uh, one, was, uh, one building type is house of worship. There are a lot of really wonderful historic house of worship in Fairfield County. And the other um, uh, is uh, public libraries. We have an extraordinary collection of public libraries um, in, this, in this county. And, um, and so uh, we use the, the parkway as kind of a guide, um, a spine to direct you to where they are. And, uh, um, and it's a sort of a little architectural history tour of, of the uh, building types as well. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Have a good night. Thank you all. And enjoy the night. Bye-bye. <laughs> Drive safely. <laughs>